So here's one you might recognize. This is the file that we've been working on for the last three weeks. Why have we got this up? Well, now I'm going to show you how to use strands, calves some roads into here in a procedural and very easy way. So this might be a little unrecognizable in that I've tidied it up a little bit. So we'll just quickly go through. So here is the file we brought in, our field shape file. Look in our outliner, there it is there. So this is actually showing us this. And I have the two mesh objects coming out as a terrain. Okay, so I have, well, we've done all this, you know all this. We've got the scatter, we've got the instances, and we've got the output, including the USD. And I've just cleaned up our output into an output switch and basically just cleaned up the entire file so that things are a bit more labeled. One thing I will quickly mention is that I have set up the connections here in a bus system, which just simply means that I am pushing the terrain along one line all the way and just pulling things off it with pass nodes as I need them. It's the same with the water. And again, there's only one thing being pulled off right now, but this will become important shortly. So what I'm gonna do is, this is very similar to the road we've just finished. What I'm gonna do is instead of building a road through here, which we can do, but instead of doing that straight away, what we need to do before that is we need to actually cut down some of these trees and we need to just cut down the trees so that we can run a road through it. We also need to flatten the terrain under the road. But essentially what we're gonna do now is we're gonna start cutting roads into this, into this forest, cutting paths and we're going to do it as a compound setup that we can just copy and paste and add another curve to and things will happen. Okay, so that will all happen inside this graph. So let's get started. First thing we're going to need to do is build a curve. So for that, I'm going to go to my top view. This is here. And I'm going to go to my curve tools. Let's do an EP curve. And I'm going to start up here. And we'll just come down through the forest because the forest, remember, is not all over the, the mountainous hills kind of thing. We'll come up here a bit. Uh, let's take a detour up here, there, back down, and then out. Press enter to get the curve. Now this is, as everything else, this is a Meyer object. And there's our curve. That's the Meyer object there. There's our USD output when we need it. But for this one, we're just gonna need this curve in Bifrost. So, just like I always do when I'm working in Bifrost and bringing things in from Maya, is I'm going to hide the original curve and let's bring this in. There it is, it's turned up over there for some reason, which is fine. We'll just call this road input curve zero zero, because numbering is fun. And before we do anything else, let's get ourselves, I'm going to go down here, so we've just got ourselves some room. Let's get ourselves a look at this. So here's our terminal, put that into there. And first thing is really apparent is that this curve, there's, there's the strand there, you're not going to see terribly much because it's literally sitting at zero, zero. It's getting lost in the trees, basically. It's actually going just a little bit under the terrain. So let's go for our first node today. Oh, in this lesson anyway, we'll just translate points. And this is going to be, we're going to use this in the system as well. So we're not just doing this just to have a look at it. And this does what it says on the box, is that it translates the points of something. So it's a strand at this point, it's got points. All I'm going to need to do is set that to a math float 3 so I can enter a value. And let's push this to 2. And there's our curve. Lift it up. And you can see how this is working. Right. And the same, you could move it that way if you wanted to as well. But I don't want to. We'll just go to one, it's fine. And straight away, I can see that the curve is really low res and we need to fix that. So we go into our segment multiplier, go to 12 is quite nice. There it is. And we can still go back to Maya and get our control vertex, let's go to the top view. So these are our curve control vertex, invert. And we can grab that one, oops. Grab that one there. And move things around as we like. This is going to be a bit easier to do and to look at once our compound sorted out, but just to show you that we're still connected, everything's fine. Let's hide that curve again. 
So what we have now, we're in top view, so let's go to there. What we have now is a curve that we drew that we want to use to cut out the trees. So how do we get this curve to remove these trees? Well, the trees are all done in the weighting. Density weights is what's controlling where the trees are and where they're not. If I take this, if I take this connection away, I get trees everywhere when I put it back. So this is controlling the weights of the trees. We went through this when we built it. But you know, reminders are cool. So that's the, the height and that's the steepness. We set all that up. We're happy with this. We're all good. So what we basically need to do is edit some values in this array corresponding to the points on the terrain where this curve is going. We're now going to start talking about things like raycasts, which I'm sure you're familiar with from Unreal. You know what a raycast is. You send out a ray and you see what it hits. Exactly the same concept here. And we have a node for it get raycast locations. Now, a location is quite literally just a location in space on a mesh. It has some other things in it as per, but you can think of it as a location in space. And to get the raycast to work, first thing we need is the geometry. And this is the geometry that you're looking to hit. So this is what you'll be testing for hits on. And what we're going to be using is the terrain. So let's bring that down there, pop it in. So we're looking for hits on the terrain. Okay, the next one, positions, is the position you are shooting the ray from. So we'll pop those in there because these are the point positions. Translate points will give us these point positions here. If you don't believe me, I'll put down uh, construct points. Take these positions, turn them into points, and I will put in a point scope. Pop that out, and those are the points coming out. So it's always good to check. I and mean, one of the things that, that we've been talking about troubleshooting a lot, and we'll be doing talking about it even more next week, but we've been talking about troubleshooting a lot in this lesson, and this is another good way to do it. So if you, you're not quite sure, then make yourself a quick visualization, take a look. To the point of you can also have a, ter a floating terminal like this, and you can move this along your graph and say, oh, you know what, I want to see, uh, I want to see, I want to see these these points here. So again, you'd make a point scope and do all that kind of thing. But it's a good way to troubleshoot what you're doing. Moving right along and going back to what we're trying to do, we're trying to raycast from this to the ground. All right. So the next thing we need are directions. And this is the direction of the ray. Okay. So in this case, we can do a couple of things. And we don't actually need this translate points. So I'm just put this in here to show you while, while I'm doing it. And we can we can we can do this a different way in a minute, but I just wanted to demo a raycast. So what I basically need is the direction the ray's going in. And for these guys, I want them to go straight down. Just poof, straight down to the ground. And that is to do that, I need a vector that is zero minus one for in the y zero. Okay. Now I can't just plug that in there. Okay, that, that's not an auto port. I need to actually put an array in there. So we can use a really quick and simple system by getting the array size. There we go, and then put in a resize array, but we're not going to resize any array. We're just going to make a new array of that size with those values in it. So this is going to make an array the same size as the number of points with our default values in it, which is perfect. Pop those down there. And you can see here, oh, no, it's not pulling, so let's get it pulling. What do we do now? We've got found and we've got locations. Great. It doesn't really tell us too much. We've got some, you know, we've got a bit of stuff going on here as well. So you've got proximity method. Semi-line means it'll just go in the direction of the directions that you put in. If you change it to line, it'll go both ways. So in, in our case, our direction is 0 minus 1, 0. It's pointing down. This raycast, when this is set to line, will look up and down for collisions. Okay, And this segment will give you the direction and the length of the vector. So it won't look past the end of that vector. For us right now, we're going to go with semi-line. We don't need reverse direction. And we don't need cutoff distance. Cutoff distance basically says don't look too far, right? We could turn that on and we know that this is 
about one above the zero. So let's make this into two just to be safe and just use it. Minimum distance is if you're raycasting from an object to itself and you don't want to register hits on the points that you're that you're testing. So for example, if I was to do something like a ambient occlusion setup for this terrain, I could maybe shoot a ray from a point down here this way up to hit the mountain, but it would hit itself first unless I put a little value in min distance. So this is the minimum distance at which you hit. This is the maximum distance at which you hit, which is cool, but it doesn't really show us anything. So let's see how we can take a look at a raycast. We have a location scope. And what a location scope is going to do is show you what the raycast is doing. So let's plug in everything at once. And it wants the same three things as this is. So it wants the positions, the directions, and the geometry. So you just need to pr plug those in. Positions and directions. It also wants the locations that you're trying to look at, which is here. And then we can just pop this out to our terminal. It'll have a think for a second. And there we go. There's something wrong with that. What's wrong with that is I have plugged in the wrong geometry. I've plugged in the strand geometry and what I needed to plug in was this geometry. So there's actually nothing wrong with our raycast. There's something wrong with our display. And that's my fault. So we just get the right geometry in there. There we go. So now you can absolutely see what we're doing because it is shooting rays down and looking for something to hit. When it doesn't hit something, it registers as a miss. And if you were to look into the array here, you'd get an array the same length as the number of points on the curve. And it would be true where these purple guys are and false where these dark blue guys are. So you can see that at either end where it's not hitting anything, it'll report back that it's not hitting anything, which is really good. And this is, this is what we need here. Okay, so we need th these locations on, on the terrain to clear for our path. And the reason I'm lifting this up and doing a raycast down is because this terrain is bumpy. Another way to do this would be a closest point. So I could drop this onto the terrain and then look for the closest point to my points on my points on the curve, which would work, but would probably a little be a little more fiddly than this, because now I'm going to add in another one. So this will give us the path, but it will give us the path along this zero width curve. What I want to do is clear some of these trees in a width. So how do I give this path a width? Well, there's another one, get points and radius. And all of this is based on the curves, right? So what we need here, it's very similar to Raycast as we need the geometry. Okay, so here's our geometry. We need the positions. This isn't giving us positions. So what I need to do is sample these locations. And what I'm going to do is sample the property. Okay. What this means is I'm using these locations, which you can see, if you zoom in real close, and we find somewhere without quite so many trees. There we go, that's one. This circle here is part of the location scope. So I can say like, don't show me where you start. Don't show me the arrow but show me the samples and you'll get these circles on the mesh that will show you the samples. We're going to sample those positions for the point position and I need to get that out of geometry and into location straight away. And again, we just need the geometry. It's default point position, but it doesn't quite know what type of data it's looking for. So I need to change that to MathFlow3 and everything comes right. Property and then there's interpolated or from closest and this, and this is it will interpolate a position from the mesh. So select the mesh. You can see that this one is not hitting on a point. It's hitting in the middle of a point. Interpolated will work out what that position is and return it to you. If I set that to from closest, then it will find the nearest point to that position. Okay. And I'm going to put it to interpolated because that's what I want to use to make my path. I don't want to have to be dependent on high, how high or low res my mesh is in terms of points to make a path through the trees. So now I've got the positions and I need the positions for this. So let's plug in our geometry and plug in our positions. And the next thing we need to put in is a radius. And that is quite simply how far out from this 
do you want to sample? So how, how far out from here do you want to get the points for? And you can see here we've got a locations and a point indices. We can get the points from, from that, which we, we're actually going to. It's, this is a, about where we want. You can say I want a radius of whatever number, max number of eight, so only the, the close the first eight points in that radius, or just at the moment it's going to get all of the points in the radius because enable max number is off. We can also use our same location scope here to take a look at this one. Plug in the locations. Uh, don't forget to not miss and actually plug in the locations. And maybe we need our own location scope for that. So I can copy that, paste that. We can take a look at this one as well. So let's plug in our locations here. Our geometry should be good. And our positions here. And we no longer need our raycast directions because this is for not, not for a raycast. I can plug this one in, in place. And you can see here that it's building a very wide path. We change our radius down, say to oh, I don't know, something like 0 0.2. Now you can see what's going on here as I'm getting all of these points. It's a bit messy, but that's okay. But it's at least showing us what we need that we've got it right. So now, how do we use this data that we've just generated to basically cut a hole in our weights array? Well, first thing I'm going to do is make myself just a little bit of room. I pull the weighting array out of there. So what these weights are, are a value for every point. And what this is are the indices of those points. So if I just make myself a set in array along here, this is my weights array coming in. And let's give this a name because we'd like to stay tidy. Path points. And I want to set that weight to zero. And I want to do it using these indices here. Now we've got a problem. The problem is, is that these indices come out as a 2D array. If you hover over that, you can see array, array long, which means for every point it's found, every position that's going in, it is giving you the points around it. So we need to turn that into just a big list of those points. There's some compounds here to do that. So let's break that so we've got our pretty trees back. <clears throat> what I'm going to do first is flatten that array, flatten nested array. So that takes the 2D array, the array of arrays, and flattens it down to a single array. Now this will include every point that every point. So it'll, it'll include all the points for position one, all the points for position two, all the points for position three as a single array. And some of those are the same. So we have another node that we can help clean it up is like sort array and remove duplicates. So we don't really care about the order. What we care about is the remove duplicates. So now this array is going to be in order with no duplicates. And if we try plugging that in to here, then look at that. We've got a path of trees because I plugged it into the wrong place. <laughs> So if we try plugging this into the index, there's our path that we've just cut out of our trees because we've set every one of these points to zero. And there it is. So that's looking pretty good. And you can, of course, go back to Maya, show your curve. Now you can do some editing pretty easily. So control vertex there. Little trick with control vertexes is you can press the up and down arrows to get to the next one. So we'll take this guy, and we'll just like move him down, maybe flatten that out. So now it's going through the mountains. So we'll bring that in just a little bit. Like we don't quite want maybe something that sharp there. So it's just a little bit of editing. I can also just go to wireframe, get a good view of it. And I've got soft selection on. Let's turn that off. So now we have a bit more control over it. So I'd like maybe make a nicer curve here. 
we're just doing something like that. And you can see that the Bifrost is, is adjusting to the curve as you change it, which is pretty nice, really. And we'll just maybe lift these guys. But you can see it, it's all just flipping through. So this, this ends up being quite a good tool to use. Let's hide our curve, and let's go back to shaded mode. And so we've got a path running through the trees, right? We can use exactly the same method to do a bunch of other things. Like we can change the color of the terrain based on this path. So before we go ahead and do any of that kind of thing, what I'm going to do is wrap this up in a compound because this will help us make, later on make uh, many paths. Okay, so essentially all we want to get out of this are these. This is exactly what our output is. So I'm going to delete these two scopes because we don't need them for a start. I'm also going to delete this terminal. Uh, no, I'm going to leave the terminal in. The terminal is a good thing to leave it because this will show us that curve. And now we're going to go through the compound that we'll use as a tool. This is not going to be a Maya tool. We won't be able to access it out here. This is a Bifrost tool. This is just for us. And we're going to have to do a couple of little special things in here, which I will show you. Before we do any of that, let's make a compound. So we're going to need all of that and all that. Okay? And we're just going to press Control G and it will group it into a compound. What should we call this? Wait by curve index, all right? Now that we have this, if I wanted to do a different curve, I could just duplicate this and it would do exactly the same thing. But you know, we maybe want to have some controls per curve as well. Go back into here and we're just gonna lay out these two. So select them, press L, press A to see everything. And now we can start cleaning things up and working with it. So first off, I'm going to put a vertical translation into this. And I don't want to put in a vector. What I want to put in is just a vertical translation. So how much to move the curve up and down. So to do that, I'm going to throw down a, just a value. And this is using that nice trick with vector values that we've looked at just before. I'm going to open up there and I'm just going to put the Y out. We'll call this vertical displacement. And then let's make sure that we've got a value here. So let's just say one, because that's what we had. And then we'll pop that into translation and nothing should change. This is a really good thing about when you're setting up controls. If you leave this live and watch it as you do, you can see if what you're doing makes sense. Also, you need to take a look at any value nodes you've already got because they will automatically become contro controls. So I happen to know that this is the raycast direction. This will break. Yep. And the reason this breaks is because this doesn't really know what it is. So we turn that into a float three. It'll come back. But we've lost our carve out because our value is no longer what it needs to be for the direction. So we'll just name it first, raycast directions. We don't have to worry about putting in, you know, we don't have to worry about putting in an array. We don't have to worry about anything like that because this is already being taken care of here. So if I was to just grab this, this guy, sorry, this click, click out nothing. Change this to negative one, our path stream. Awesome, moving right along. So this is just a pass node. Give this the good name too. So we'll call this uh, just Geo. Geo's easy. We'll call it Geo and we'll call this strand. Now you could, with a point offset, put in a single strand that contains multitudes and it should do the same thing. So I'm just organizing real quick. Absolutely up to you how you have things set up. This is going to be a display because it will just take out the diagnostic figure out. You can see that there's a D for diagnostic, I can turn that off. And that's just showing me my curve. But just to make things a little bit nicer, let's make sure that that curve is easy to see. So I'm going to assign a diagnostic material. And we make that a float three. And I'm just going to make it red. For now, we could put that out as a control as well. In fact, we just might. And this way I'll be able to show you something else earlier. Yeah, let's do that. So instead of dragging this back here to the single input that we've had, I'm going to make a new input. This input's got nothing on it right now, so we just put that up here and strand display color. So now I can come out here and I can change this. And of course, because this is a color, I might want it to be a color picker. So that's the customize UI window. Really simple. You just you have a, you have a compound that you've got. I can go out and select it as well if you like. Hit the little pencil icon, select what you want to do, and then you can change. 
options on it, including setting min, min and max values. We've got the color picker now. So now we've got a display color, which is great. We can change the color of that of our strand just to show us what's going on. Like if we were working on Mars, red may not be the best color for it. Maybe like we'd want to do more of a sort of a blue kind of thing. And the strand color changes. Right now I'm going to go straight to white and leave that as it is. So this is our display section and that's all done. So here's our pass. This is building our array for our directions and here's our first raycast. Then we're sampling our point position, getting our points and radius, doing what we need to do to our arrays as they come out. So flatten and sort and remove duplicates and then output. So let's change the output name straight away. Indices, indexes. Indices. Now the other one that we might want to put out, and we'll give it its own input as well. Yes, it's a little impromptu lesson on making compounds. We want to put out the radius because this is going to control the path width. We just call that path width. And you can see if I come out here and change that to 0 0.1, I get a skinnier path. Or 0 0.25, I get a wider one. It's nice and simple, nice and easy. And the beautiful thing is you need to do this once. Like you do it once, you just set it up once, and then you can use it over and over and over again. You know, as long as you get it set up properly, it might take you a little while to get it set up, but once it's set up, it's brilliant. We've got our compound. We can move things around in our customize UI. So if I want my, oh, I don't know, my display color at the very bottom, I can just drag that down and it moves. If I want my path width to be more important than my Raycast direction, I can move it up, for example. And it's all stuff like that. It's great. There's more you can do in here as well, but uh, we're not going into that today because it's outside the scope of today's work. So we now have a weight by curve index. What, do, what happens if we want to change the color, right? So the color of our terrain. So how are we doing our color now? Let's go to field shape, which is the other, the other Bifrost graph that we're drawing in. Here's our array of things. This still has its USD output, but it's set to off. And here's our coloring. So let's go in here and take a look. We are coloring this by assigning a material to it, which is fine. We're using a set geo property reference on our point color. So that means we have a point color attribute on this. We can use that. And we can do exactly the same thing we've been doing with this array. So what I can do is I can take the terrain, get, get the property, that property is point color, and it's an array of float trees. So this is our color array. Now, you see how this worked in here? We've just got the indices here, and we're doing a set and array. So we just can do exactly the same thing to the color, and we'll grab our indices, connect those, and then before it goes into its bus, we'll do set geo property. And let's play this safe. So that's the property that we're getting. We'll create a value node out of that. And sometimes those value nodes decide to disappear. If you press L for layout, they usually come back somewhere close. I can just take that, pop it in there. So I'm getting the point color. And because I've got no data, it's all going black. I'm getting the point color and I'm setting the point color. And I know that's true because these are going to both. I'm not typing things in. Then I can take this array and pop it into data. Now, I haven't given it a value to set. So it's just assuming that value is zero, zero, zero. This could be a black road, I guess, if you wanted to. But I don't want to. I, want, I don't even want a road right now. I just want sort of a sand, like a sandy path. So if I put a one in here and a point, Nine in here, and point seven in here. I've got kind of a sandy colored path. These are just vertex colors, but of course, as you know, going into a game engine, you can take them out and do things with them. You can also, with a little bit more work, blend the edges. But what that involves is finding, you need to find the distance between these points and these points and then set yourself up a F curve or a lerp or whatever you're going to do. But I'm not going to do that today because we're really just talking about paths. So here's a path through the forest. 
So we're using the same data to get rid of our trees and change the color of our path. You can use this data to do other things as well using just this method. So if I take my terrain here and go get point position and then set an array and set point position and then I guess we'll be doing something like Get a bit tight up here, we're going to have to do another reorganize, but that's all right. That's absolutely fine. Let's just grab those guys and pull them back a bit for now. Pull this guy forward. Put that in there. Colors don't change. The trees did a little bit because my positions have changed. Now, I'm not changing my position just yet. I'm going to need another instance of this into our index. Now something's happening. Things are going funny because this is setting everything to zero, zero, zero. All right, so this one's gonna be a little bit more complicated, which is fine, we can handle that. I got my point positions. I don't wanna actually set the X and Z of my point positions. What I wanna do is set the Y value. I wanna lift that path up and down. So we know how to do that. We go vector to scalar. So we're taking our position here and we'll just break this for now. All going to disappear which is fine. What we'll be setting is in the Y array there. And then once we've done that we can go scale it to vector, scale it to vector 3 and we want the X position from here, the Z position from here and the Y position that we've set in our array and then that gets popped back into set point position. Right now you can see that because this is set to zero, our set and array, it's dropped everything to zero. So we've suddenly got ourselves a path that is at zero. So it's like carved its way through the hills. It's, I don't think this, this was much below zero, but it would have lifted up things that, that weren't. And you can, you can kind of see what's going on there which is cool. So this is a bit of a mess. Let's make ourselves a bit of a compound to just clean this up and keep it, keep everything looking nice. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to make compounds out of each of these. Okay, so this, this becomes one compound and we'll call this set path y, right? And you can see what's coming into it is the mesh itself and the indices that need to change. We're going to do the same for this one. This may not be happy. Oh no, that's fairly happy. But it's clumsy. So what we're going to do here is instead of putting straight out from the terrain into our geometry, we're going to do our set path Y before we do our colors. So we'll drop that down here, put that in here. Nothing should change. Nothing does, which is great. And now it just makes it easier for us to grab those, make a compound, and we'll call this set path color. Okay, so there's a couple of like little things that we're really going to probably need here. We need to change the names here, right? So I don't need this to be here at all. What I can do is just lay that out. So I can break that, clear the value where things break, and then Cleared the value just in case it wasn't point color and then just change that to point color because we are just changing the point color of the path but what we are going to need to see is what color would we like to change it to let's call that color value and again i can come up here grab this guy select the attribute change it to a color picker like that and what that looks like is you've got a way to change this now so if I want it to be a little more sandy, there you go. It's going to be a little less, a bit more dirt colored. We could go up here somewhere. You get the idea. And we'll just go with our like, sandy path right now, which is cool. So that's our set path color. Do some naming. 
indices to affect. We don't need this anymore because it's don't we? Oh, we don't. Look. Here we are. Another piece of troubleshooting. So we're just going to replicate that inside here. Create a value node. It's point color. And then drop that one in there. We can then get rid of that. We don't need that output. So there's our path color. And this is our vertical displacement. And we do a couple of the same things here. So geometry in. Let's try and keep ourselves consistent and go in, geom in geometry, in geometry, out geometry, in geometry, out geometry. Cool. Indices to effect. And then we'll lay this out as well. We need to get the value that we want. And of course, now I can change this. So I can say, like, you know, maybe I want to lift that path up. So 0 0.2. See the path lifts up. You would want to put in some mechanism for softening the edges there if you wanted to. But at this point here, I could completely put myself into. And that looks shaded. What that means is I'm going to need to update the mesh normals before they go out of here. Update mesh normals, just to get everything back the way it was. There we go. And now it's giving giving a more accurate description in the viewport of what you're doing. So you can see how that works. What I'm also going to do for the point position is I'm going to put in a condition to say, maybe I don't want to use this at all. So that's, that's pretty easy. You just need to come to your set point position and put down an if statement. And if that's true, we want to have our displaced points. But if it's false, we just want to have our point positions. Okay. You could even do it, much better way even, is to do it after the update mesh normal. So the last thing you do. So if that condition is true, we want the displaced points. If it's false, it just becomes a pass through. So it comes in, goes out, it's the same thing. So right now, it'll just drop and we'll get everything back. If I turn this on, it'll lift. Cool. I like that. Put that out. Rename it. Just move this just up. No, not so not so far up. Just to there. Cool. So now we're we've got that. I'm gonna turn that off too. Now we've got the ability to change our colors. We're cutting a path through our points and we have the ability to raise or lower that path. So that's looking pretty cool. We've got a nice sort of wide road going on. So if you switch over to top view, you can see we've got this weird little splotch here. Now it's just clearing out the trees and it's putting a path there. That's going to be at the origin. What that means is inside of here somewhere, there is a point position that isn't being found. So it goes to its default, which is 0, 0, 0. And it's in the sample property. So to fix that, all we have to do is use this success node. This is telling us if it's worked or not. You can use a find all true and array. I'm going to just shift these guys along a bit. And this guy gets a get from array. So we're only interested in the ones that actually work and then plug that into the positions. And there you go, fixed and disappeared. So what I'm gonna do now while I'm in the top view is show you how to set up a second curve for that. And then we'll talk about getting all of this out to the engine. So if I come back here, I go to create curve tools. We'll use EP again. I'll zoom in a little bit up, oh, maybe up here somewhere, maybe, no, maybe here. I'll zoom in a bit. I'm gonna start kind of at the center of this curve. Let's draw my curve. Like before, so this is my Maya input curve. Of course, you could use anything as an input curve. There we go. So I have a new curve. And it's exactly the same thing. If I drag this in, 
copy this name, paste it. It'll add a 01 on the end for me. There it is, which is great. Segment multiplier was 12. Let's go 12. Which is awesome. All I've got to do is copy and paste this. So I need to change what curve is coming in. So now if I hide my my curve, there we go, don't need that anymore. Let's deselect everything. So let's just change the display color here so we know that they're different curves. I mean, we already know, but let's just be sure. Red's a bad color. Green's a bad color. Bright yellow is better, but not great. Let's go hot pink. There we go. We'll make that a bit brighter too. So here's our other, here's our next curve. So we'll just zoom in here and just make sure that we're looking all right. Yep, we're looking all right. So now the problem becomes, how do I add this to this and this and this? Well, it's pretty simple. All you need to do is build an array of the two. Because we made sure that there was that we removed all the duplicates from the arrays. And if I plug that into there, you can see my clearing is working. If I then take it and plug it into here, then we've got our colors as well. But here's the nice thing, because I've used two separate compounds, I could say I want this one to be half the size. So you've got a minor path now. And you can just rinse and repeat this as much as you like. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to bring this path down here. This is just tidying up. I'm going to pop it in there as well, because that's all we need. And then I'm going to move it back down equal with these guys. We'll just move this entire area backwards like this. Except you, buddy. You can you can go back over there. So all of these have the ability to set the, the Y position. They have the ability to change the colors. Now, they'll all be the same color if you wanted to do it to do different colors for different paths, then you'd have to get in here and take two sets of indices and do the same thing. So it's pretty cool, really. It's just, you'd need to output this part, this new color array into the, another set path color and do it there, which is fine. So really, really quickly, we'll just do one more. We're still in our top view. Where should we go? Where, where do we need a path? Oh, I don't know. Up here is pretty good. Create curve, EP curve, zoom in a bit. Let's, let's just make a little cul-de-sac. So we're going to start pretty much on that curve. We're going to go up here. Just go off around this lake and come back on. There's our curve. It's pretty ugly. That's all right. Bring it in. Duplicate this guy, copy and paste, change the curve going in, and then it's real simple. You just add that to that array. Of course, I'll need to make sure that that connected properly. And it's good to have a few more points in there. So there you go. So you can really quickly and easily build this kind of thing. Um, there's, you know, there is more advanced ways to do it where you can take these in array loop through them and build an array with an iterate loop. That, that would be another way to do it. You could loop through every curve you've got coming in and then just use this once inside an iterate loop and this is what you would be iterating over. It's, it's, it's exactly the same as what we did for the Fibonacci spiral. Just instead of iterating over a sequence, you're iterating over the number of curves you've got coming in and doing this to each one, then adding it to an array. <clears throat> In the end, you'd still get out, essentially this is what would come out here. But yeah, so there we go, that's strands. I've shown you how to build them, I've shown you how to play with them, and I've also taken them into our project here, which we'll be using next week to add volumes. Before we go, last thing, let's talk about getting this out to the engine, and, and that's a really nice thing. It's already out to the engine. Let me show you. 